Hi, welcome to the B&H event space. My name is Dave Piazza, and I'm here from Westcott, who is a lighting company based in Toledo, Ohio. Actually, Maumee, Ohio, I'm sorry. And uh, if you haven't heard of Westcott before, we have been in business since 1899. Uh, yeah, 119 years making rain umbrellas. Um, and we got into the photo industry in the 20s with umbrellas, putting a different material on it for photographers. <clears throat> Today, um, we're a full line lighting company where we make lights and light modifiers and backgrounds. Um, uh, and so today, I'm here to do a seminar called Lighting Basics Made Easy. So I would, I would hope that you're all a little bit um, on the beginner side, that's what we're doing. This is, gonna, this is gonna be a basic talk. A, B, C of lighting to get some of the misconceptions and some information out there that you can make proper decisions when you wanna do some lighting. Let's talk about the properties of light that I'm concerned about, what different lights have what properties, and really all of this is about what choices you make when you wanna do, uh, uh, do some lighting. There is no right or wrong of lighting. There are a few guidelines. It's more guidelines than rules. There are some rules, though, and the rules are really not dictated by anybody making them up. It's science and it's math. Uh, photography is based in math. A lot of it is based in math, and so is lighting. There are certain things we can actually calculate before if we want to. So the major um, properties that I'm concerned about as a photographer or videographer when I'm deciding my lighting is first of all the color of the light, the second is the specularity of it, and the third is the power of it. Those are the, the, the three main functions of what I choose light. When I talk about the color, I am really talking about two things, color temperature and CRI. I'll get to back to CRI in just a moment. Uh, um, the specularity or the contrast of the light. Specularity. It's a it's a it's a a loaded word that means a lot. Specularity is a very specific type of contrast. Specularity has to do with a concentration of light. We probably have a concentration of light right about here. Am I right? Do I have a white spot right here? I'm guessing, I'm, the light that's hitting my bald head is reflecting greatly, it's a little bit of concentration of light. That's a specular highlight. I'm very concerned about specular highlights because the conscious control of specular highlights is what photographic and video lighting is all about. That's what determines if a light is soft or harsh. Soft or harsh is a subjective quality. We use different um, uh, uh, qualities depending on what we're shooting. But I'm concerned about the specularity. Third thing is the power and how I can adjust the power. Uh, most electronic flashes, you have a wide range of, of, of being able to adjust power. Most of you, I would assume, own speed lights. Anybody here not own a speed light? You don't own a speed light. What do you, is it, it, are you shooting available light? Or do you have studio lighting? Studio light, so you want you just forego the speed light altogether. Well, there's not much of a difference between studio lights and speed lights in terms of electronic flash. They're both pretty much the same. I'll get into that as we go on with this too. Um, uh, continuous light, well, let me back up just a second, and, and let's really make this as basic as I can. There really are two types of light that we can use as photographers, only two. Electronic flash and continuous light. It really is as simple as that. A videographer only really has one choice of light that he can use, and that's continuous light. Make sense? Now when we talk about continuous light, there are several types. Continuous light come in daylight. Daylight is a form of continuous light. And you really have to keep this in mind because most of us start our photography shooting with available light or daylight. That's a form of continuous light. We have tungsten bulbs. Tungsten bulbs where have been in use literally for about 100 years. And they're, they're getting a, a, a much more out of favor today because of their properties. Uh, um, their properties are they're hot. 
that's probably the biggest concern with a tungsten lamp. And they use a lot of power. They've really been supplanted with daylight fluorescent, which is another very viable continuous light source. I love daylight fluorescent. But now LEDs are starting to take over. And the quality of the LEDs have risen to a point that I think they're better than a lot of daylight fluorescent. They're very easy to use. They're, they give you a lot of adjustability. So on the electronic flash side, there are four types of electronic flash available to us. There's the flash that's built in your camera. Almost all of our cameras have it. Low flash is on top of the camera. If you have a DSLR, that is relatively useless. Uh, the one thing they are good for is some of the camera manufacturers are using that to work your electronic flash or your speed light wirelessly. But in terms of a light source to take photographs with, it's pretty awful. Maybe good for snapshots, that's about it. The second type is a speed light. A lot, speed light is, is one of the more popular um, uh, artificial light sources that photographers use. And the reason they do is because it packs a lot of punch in a very small package. You can fit it right on top of the camera. Most uh, camera manufacturers work very well with electronic flash, or pardon me, with speed lights. Uh, they're portable, battery operated, four AA uh, gives you hundreds of flashes. Uh, the third type is a mono light or a studio strobe. That's what we most of us know of, of a studio strobe. It's a self-contained unit. It's called a mono light because it is mono. It's only one light. You plug that light directly in the wall. Today, a lot of them use batteries, but it's still a self-contained unit. It is extremely similar, if not identical, to the quality of light that comes out of a speed light, except it's more powerful. That's probably the biggest difference, and you can put light modifiers on it easier. The fourth type are power pack strobes, which are still used in the high-end professional market. A power pack strobe is simply a power pack. Usually, they're at least this big. Sometimes they get larger. They pack a lot more power. If we measure um, the amount of power in watt seconds, which I can have a whole class about watt seconds, but it does give you an idea of how much uh, power is packed into a into a strobe. Uh, most mono lights are around 400 watt seconds. Most speed lights are equivalent of between 25 and 50 or 75 watt seconds. Most power pack, pack strobes start at 800 watt seconds and go up to maybe 10,000. Quite a bit of a power range. They have that power range because the, the, the very extensive ones have many different connections on it that you have individual flash heads. So the flash heads only have the flash tube in it connected with a proprietary cable, which means that head goes with that manufacturer of light. You plug it in, and then you get um, the power directly from the power pack to the strobe head. That power is divided up depending on how many heads you have. So let's say, for example, you've got a 1,000 watt second power pack. On some inexpensive power pack units, if you put two strobes onto it, or two uh, heads onto it, you're going to divide the power equally, 500 and 500. There are more expensive power packs, asymmetrical, that allow you to change the amount of watt seconds going to each head. So one could have 200, one could have 100, and you don't even use the rest of the power. That's really what you're paying for when you have a power pack. You're paying for power, and you're paying for a lot of multiple heads. So um, now let's talk about the property of all these lights, where um, we have, I'm going to bring it back to color temperature or color of the light, specularity, and power adjustment. So when I talk about color, we have, I'm sure you've all heard of color temperature. Color temperature. It is the measurement of the yellow-blue scale of light. That's exactly what it is. It's measured in degrees Kelvin. So the lower the color temperature, the yellower the light, the higher the color temperature, the bluer the light. Uh, an incandescent bulb, not much of us, many of us have incandescent bulbs in our house anymore, but if you do, I'm talking about the small little bulb that costs about 25 cent, 50 watt, 60 watt, 100 watt. Those are 2,700 degrees Kelvin, almost um, uh, universally. A tungsten light used in professional use, which are still being used quite a bit, on, especially in some very high-end um, videography, 
and in movie sets they still do use tungsten lights, they're 3200 degree Kelvin. And they're pretty standard at 3200 degree Kelvin and they maintain that consistency through the life of the bulb. Um, uh, a higher color temperature like 3500 or so, some fluorescent bulbs are reaching 3500 degree Kelvin. Fluorescent bulbs are kind of all over the place with color temperature. They can be as low as 2700. In fact, manufacturers are producing the uh, fluorescent bulbs, compact ones, the squiggle bulbs that you would you would use in place of an incandescent bulb. Those are typically 2700 degrees Kelvin because they're a uh, manufacturer is producing that to replace an incandescent bulb. That's what they're doing. So it's 3,700 or 2,700 degrees. We're used to seeing that. When you go into a store for bulbs for home use, you will see, they'll usually call it a warm white bulb. It really isn't that white. It's yellowish, but it's called a warm white, 2,700 degrees Kelvin. Then they may have one that they call a white bulb. That's usually 3,500 to 4,000 degrees Kelvin. Fluorescent, I'm talking about. And then they have daylight. And daylight is about 5,000, 5,500, 6,000. Um, the interesting thing is that daylight, you can have wide ranges of color temperature. It can go as low as 1,000 degrees Kelvin up to 10, 12,000 degrees Kelvin. Now keep in mind, this is only measuring the yellow blue scale of light, not the other colors in the spectrum. We have another spec for that. So. Very early in the morning, very late at night, you may get a very low color temperature, the yellowish sky, you get, a, you get a warm kind of glow out of it. As the day goes by, at midday, it's about 5,000 degrees Kelvin. And that's a cloudless day. If you've got bright sun coming down, it's around 5,000. Interestingly enough, when clouds come by, color temperature rises to about 6,000 degrees Kelvin. You know this to be true if you look on your uh, DSLR and you have white balance presets, you're gonna have three different daylight settings. You'll have a sun, which is daylight, about 5,000 degrees Kelvin. They will have a picture of a cloud that's blue or light, about 6,000 degrees Kelvin. Then they also may have a picture of shade. Shade is even higher, it's blue or light. 7,000, 8,000. In fact, on some days, when you, when you have a bright sun with snow on the ground, in the shade, the, uh, the shade can get up to around 10,000, 11,000 degrees Kelvin, very blue. It's just the way it is. So this variation in, in uh, uh, color temperature exists also in tungsten bulbs, not so much in electronic flash. With tungsten bulbs, like I said, most of them are 2,700 degrees Kelvin. Professional ones are 3,200 degrees Kelvin. Now we're not even gonna talk about mercury, uh, uh, mercury vapor lamps and other types like that. They're, they're not usually used in photography, but just be aware that there are differences even in tungsten bulbs. One of the issues with using a household lamp, I'm talking about a, a cheap little incandescent bulb for photographic purposes is that they're very inconsistent. When you burn a bulb, a incandescent bulb usually has a life of about a thousand hours. And as you burn it, it immediately starts losing color temperature and it starts losing intensity. It's very subtle, but if you were to actually measure very carefully what the color temperature is in a bulb when it was brand new and measure it when it's 500 hours old, you're gonna get a different reading. And you're also gonna get a different reading depending on the bulb. Now, there are incandescent bulbs that are used for photographic use. They're called photo floods. I'm sure a lot of you people have used photo floods. I know I have. 250 watt, 500 watt. Uh, tungsten lamp, it's very bright, very hot. I believe an ECT is a 500 watt lamp. Um, that is, is uh, rated at 3200 degrees Kelvin and it's actually stated and printed on the bulb, 3200 degrees Kelvin. Now since the manufacturer is stating that it's 3200 3, degrees Kelvin on the bulb, they have to make sure that it maintains that color temperature during the life of the bulb. Well, how do they do that? they shorten the life of the bulb. Those bulbs only last about 50, 60 hours. 
literally. If this view get that much out of them, typically they burn out after 10, 15, 20 hours of use. Um, the main reason we do, if any of you are using an incandescent bulb uh, for photographic use, a photo flood, and you turn it off and you move the, the light right away, you're gonna shorten the life of the bulb. It needs to be completely cooled down before you even, even move it. So um, the consistency is what's very important in all of our light sources. Now, when we talk about daylight fluorescent, those are kind of all over the map in terms of color temperature. The bulbs last a lot longer, usually about 8,000 hours is a standard life of a, of a fluorescent bulb. And um, that 8,000 hours, depending on the quality of the bulb, the color temperature will shift over time unless it's a bulb made for photographic use. Now, how do you know if it's a bulb made for photographic use? We have another spec that we use called CRI color rendition index, or color rendering index. Uh, the, it, the definition of that is the measurement of how accurately a light source reproduces colors as compared to daylight. It's the accuracy of reproduction of color as compared to daylight. Now, it's measured zero to 100. 100 is theoretically daylight. Uh, it's irrespective of the color temperature, interestingly enough. It is really the measurement of all the colors of the spectrum. There are several colors of the spectrum, red, green, blue, magenta, green, cyan. There's basically six colors, positive colors, negative colors. Again, we can have a whole seminar just about color theory. But be aware that when we have a CRI below 90, that is typically telling you that that light source is not good for photographic or video use. It applies mostly to um, daylight fluorescent bulbs, or pardon me, fluorescent bulbs and LEDs. Fluorescent bulbs and LEDs are inherently green. They have green in them. I think you probably have noticed this at some time or another. If you've ever taken a photograph under fluorescent lighting with your camera set on a, a daylight preset, it's gonna come out greenish yellow. It's gonna come out greenish yellow because the CRI is low and the color temperature is low. It's not daylight. It's maybe 3,500 degrees Kelvin. You also have a fluorescent preset on your cameras if you've ever noticed that one. If you ever used it, what it does is it makes the photograph magenta. Magenta is like pink. It's a pinkish blue. Magenta is the opposite of green. See, all this stuff makes sense. This is not, this is not something we made up in the past 10, 20 years. This has been existent for years and years and years. CRI has been very important since the early 1900s, since we had artificial light that was becoming prevalent. And it be became very important in things like museums, art galleries, store displays, store displays in particular, because if you are showing clothing in a store, the color of it is dependent on what the light source is like. So CRI has been measured for, again, 100 years, around 100 years. And it's an important one to recognize. So most electronic flashes, and what's interesting about electronic flash is that almost all of them are daylight. They're about 5,500 degrees Kelvin, 56, 5,700 degrees Kelvin. Going back to my VPS days, one of the reasons that VPS was, was uh, invented by Kodak was that it had a little bit of a blue bias. Electronic flash is a little bit bluer than daylight. And when you shot weddings with it, the way daylight, or especially electronic flash, reflects off of a bride's gown, which is usually a white satin, or it's a veil, it tends to go blue. So if you're using a film that was rated more towards regular daylight, like for example, Kodakolor film. Kodakolor film was rated at 4,800 degrees Kelvin. It was rated at 4,800 degrees Kelvin because two things. Number one, it was trying to uh, uh, please amateurs that would use the film under many different lighting conditions. So if they use it in tungsten light, it would hopefully take away some of that yellow effect. But it also recognized the fact that film ages as it sits on the shelf. And as it ages, if it sits on the shelf, the color temperature sensitivity shifts. It goes up. 
So when the film came out of the Kodak factory, it may have been 4,800 degrees Kelvin. After it sits in the shelf for maybe six months or a year, it may rise up to 4,900, 4,950. VPS was a film that had to be kept frozen. And it was kept frozen because it was, came out of the factory at 5,600 degrees Kelvin, I believe, and you want to maintain that 5,600 degrees. Now, I tell you all this <coughs> mainly because you understand that all of this stuff matters. It matters quite a bit. With digital today, we have, this, uh, we have a, a blessing and a curse. The blessing is we're not worried about this color temperature sensitivity of the, lights, of the, of the light gathering material that much anymore because we can set it anywhere we want. We have the ability to do custom white balance. We have custom presets. We have Photoshop that can correct color. So we've got a lot of variety in color. And we can change the sensitivity of color halfway through a shooting session. We couldn't do that with film. You put the roll of film in, you're stuck. Now, when um, feature films, I've always been shot on film. They're, they're, I, I'm not going to tell you they're totally over to digital, but they're pretty darn close. Most, most TV programs are being shot with digital now, and that was not true 10 years ago. Uh, feature films are, I don't know the exact percentage, but I would, I would guesstimate that it's probably 60 or 70 percent are digital now. And when they shot film with feature films, they were using slide film. That's all movie film is. It's slide film that's moving at 60 frames per second or whatever it is. So uh, the movie people understood this, and they, they enjoyed that film because they knew what it would give them. And to get different effects, they'd have to use gels. This is the explanation on everything, on, on why we do this, this type of thing, and how photography and lighting progressed. Now let's bring it to today. Um, um, the other thing I'm concerned about, this, this whole story about color. And be aware that the lights I'm using today are LEDs. They have a CRI of 96. They're very consistent through the whole dimming range. Um, um, they've got a very long life, and they will maintain that color temperature and that CRI during the whole life of the chip, which is about 30,000 hours, quite a long time. Um, um, all LEDs are not made equally. Um, it's actually not necessarily the chip that differs in quality. It's how the power is distributed to the chip. Inside every LED light, there is a computer board. So that's how everything is regulated. It has to do with regulation of power going to it. So now let's get to specularity. And I want to start giving you some illustrations. I got a great model here today, Logan. Say hello to everybody. Say hello, Logan. Yeah, Logan's great. So um, we're going to try and do the best kind of illustration we can here. I am going to shoot tethered as I give you some examples. Um, specularity is one that is pretty obvious. I'm going to use my ice light. My ice light is a handhold LED. And I think right now you can see on the tip of her nose and right on her lips, you see some white highlights. Those are specular highlights. This is actually pretty soft light right here. If I turn on, let me turn on this light. I'll take away all my diffusion. Now give your eyes a second to adjust. Yeah, using a continuous light is very much like going from inside to outdoors when you're at a sunny day. It takes a second for your, your pupils to get down a little bit. Um, that's one of the differences. I feel some major difference between electronic flash, let's say speed lights, and using continuous light is what the eyes look like. Some photographers like dilated pupils. They just like them. I don't. I like a smaller pupil especially if my subject has got light color eyes. I think it looks nicer. And of course, Logan's got these beautiful blue eyes, so her, your pupils are smaller already. So I've got a diffusion dome on this, and let's take, a, let's take some pictures. Let's see if I can show this on the screen. Okay, this when it comes up here. This is a relatively specular photograph. And you, you can see the cheekbone is kind of white. There's kind of a deepish shadow next to her nose. Um, uh, I can see a shadow from her hair. 
Now that's because I'm basically using a naked LED. There's no diffusion on this, there's no light modification on this. So let's go ahead and put the light dome on it. We, um, this happens to be my Solix LED, uh, and it comes with a diffusion dome. The diffusion dome goes on with a magnet, and what it does is it spreads out the light. Get it on there. It cuts down your exposure by about a third of an f-stop or so, but it, it disperses the light. This is what diffusion does. In fact, before I go any further, let's, let, let's talk about what makes light soft. Diffusion aids in making it soft, but it, technically it really doesn't make it soft. What diffusion does is disperse light. Now, if the definition of a specular highlight is a concentration of light, obviously, if I disperse it some and make that concentration larger, it gives the appearance of softer light. The true definition of soft light is really the relationship between the shadow and the highlight. Okay? If I have, like the photograph I have there right now, you can see a very definitive graduate. There's not really a graduation. It's a little bit of a, of a graduation between the highlight and the shadow. I'm looking on the side of her nose. In fact, I'm casting a shadow on her nose. That's relatively harsh light. What will make it soft, diffusion will help, but what really makes it soft is making it bigger. It's all about size. The bigger the light, the softer the light. Now, as I go through this, I'm gonna explain that even further. Right now, let's just continue with the demo and take a picture with just the diffusion dome on. I put it on, I'm gonna change my exposure a teeny bit because it's cutting down the light a little bit. So let's try this. Did I cut your head off on that one? No. Did you stand up straighter? I did. Yeah, you did. You did, didn't you? <laughs> let's see what this looks like. Exposure should be similar. Yeah, I got your eyes closed. That's okay. Uh, a little bit of a difference there. A teeny bit. Um, let's see if I can show the other picture. Not huge. It's not a huge difference. Now, I'm gonna put the diffusion panel on. And for, I selected for this, I have a thin diffusion panel on here, just a quarter stop. A quarter stop, it's thinner. And the reason I use a thinner one is because I know this light, it's got a diffusion dome on it, and um, it's, it's relatively big in relation to uh, uh, my model. And so I, it works pretty good. Let's check it out. Okay. Not moving anything. I'm gonna I'm gonna increase my exposure a little bit. Actually, I'm gonna go to A. Let's see what it looks like. Let's see what we get. Exposure's still pretty good. Now I think you're seeing a, de a definite, distinct. I'm gonna go to the first one. A distinct difference between the shadow and the side of the nose. A distinct difference. That's what the size of the light will do for you. That's softness. So let's talk about softness for a second and size of light and, and why we're making these choices. Uh, we've got a lot of different light modifiers available to us and a lot of different techniques. I'm gonna go over basic techniques today. This is, again, a, um, a lighting basics class. Later on, I'll probably do an intermediate class, but let's talk about the basics right now. The size of the light is determined by two different factors. How big the light is and how far away it is. If I have a light like this, I'm gonna turn it off just so you can see it. This is the size of the light right here. It's about that big around. When I put it in the soft box, that happens to be about a two foot by almost three foot, 24 by 32 inch. It's larger. Now, if I have 
two lights that are different sizes at the same distance away, the larger one is going to give me softer light than the smaller one. But the other thing that regulates size is how close to the subject it is. If I have two lights that are exactly the same size, one's closer to you, that's going to be bigger than this because it's right on top of your face. So it has to do with the size of the light in relation to the size of your subject. A light in close is softer than a light further away. It's as simple as that. Many people think the opposite is true. Unfortunately, that's the natural uh, conclusion you come up with. And this is the equation that it comes up with. You have a speed light that's on top of your camera. You have it unmodified. You take a picture and you leave the camera on automatic, which I think is a huge mistake, by the way. I never, hardly ever shoot my camera in automatic. What happens when you have that frame? Let's say I've got a picture of you and I've got the frame around it. The flash fires with no light modification. It hits your face. The camera sees everything and is trying to make that light light everything up. It doesn't kind of understands that light is hitting your face and coming back. The camera's getting better and better with this all, all, all the time. But typically, a lot of results you get is washed out. It's a little bit washed out and you get a dark background. Well, when I, when I, I give that situation to a lot of end users and they say, well, the solution is to move the light further away. And they might be true if they change their exposure, but really, it's making the light harsher. What's really going on here is that it's an exposure problem. You have to expose properly. Exposure is critical when we talk about any kind of lighting. If you expose off, it'll make things look duller than they're supposed to or more contrasty. So exposure, I think, is very critical here. Just keep in mind that a light in close is softer than one further away, period. Now, why, what do we decide, where do we decide to place a light when we're taking a portrait? I'm talking about portraits mainly today. What makes the decision on where to put a light in terms of distance? And I have a, a simple uh, a solution. I put it as close as I possibly can without putting it right on top of them. I want that light close. I like soft light. That's what I'm doing. So I'm bringing it in close. Now, what is affected when you change the distance between your light and your subject? And what would make me bring it further back? Most of that has to do with coverage. Coverage, as simple as that. A light in close covers less than a light further away. I think you all know this. Get a flashlight, put it really close to a wall, you get this little cone of light. As you bring the flashlight away from the wall, what happens to the cone of light? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's what happens. This is the science part of it. This is the math part of it. So if I have a subject like this, I'm taking a simple portrait. At the most, I want to light from about right around chest high to here. This is about all I want to light in a standard portrait. That's it. So this softbox, actually, I've got a little bit too far away. I, I'm going to bring it a little bit closer. I want that really nice and close. Now, I'm not going to be lighting her legs or her feet, but I don't care about that on this shot. So when I do have a photograph that I want to do a full length, and I use the same size softbox, the way to cover that is to bring the light further away. Now, what happens when I do that? Two things happen when I move that light further away from the subject. Number one, it gets dimmer. I have to, I'm, use, I'm losing power. I'm constantly losing power. I'm not going to get into the squared inverse rule, but just be aware that as you move a light further away from your subject, you exponentially lose intensity. Quickly, too, pretty quickly. Not a big deal in today's cameras, and I'll get back to that in a second. The other thing that happens is that I get more coverage, but I'm going to pick up harshness because that light source is getting smaller in relation to my subject. So one of the oddities that we have and one of the uh, selection processes we have when I talk to customers like you is when you open up one of my catalogs, we probably have about 
I don't know, 15 different size and shape soft boxes. All kinds of different sizes and shapes. We make everything from uh, 1622, 2432, 3648, 5472. We make two octobanks, five foot, seven foot. Uh, for electronic flashes uh, or speed lights, we make a 26 inch octa, a 20 inch octa, a 10 by 24 strip, a 24 inch beauty dish, a 36 inch and 48 inch octa for um, studio strobes, a, another strip, 12 by 36 strip, 12 by 50. We make all these different shapes and sizes. And, then, and it really has to do with exactly what I talked about. If I'm shooting a full length, let's say a fashion photo, photograph, and I want to light the whole body, but I want to maintain softness, I use a big light modifier. If I've got a seven foot octobank, like, and you're six feet tall maybe, I put that right over here, I'm going to get complete coverage and softness. That's the whole deal right there, folks. The big difference between rectangular boxes and octa or round ones, there's a difference between octa and round ones. Let's just talk about this. It has to do with the catch light in the eye. Right here, you should be able to see the photograph I just took. I think I can get that bigger. Oh, yeah, I can do it like to this. There's the catch light in the eye. It's a rectangle. I can see it. So. That is some of the consideration that comes into it. The, how it was explained to me once, I'm not sure how true this is, but I'm gonna tell you what I've heard, and it kind of makes sense. When you're in the studio, you're inside, we wanna duplicate what window light looks like, and most windows are rectangular or square. <coughs> looks natural. Painters, centuries ago, that's what they put in their paintings because if they were, shoot, if they were painting a portrait inside, that's the shape catch light they had in the eye. When you're outside, you have the sun, it gives you a round catch light. And some people would rather have that. With the advent of speed light photography, and a lot of people using speed lights outdoors, that's one of the reasons we started producing octas for our, for our speed light light modifiers, is that you get a roundish catch light in the eye. The, there is a difference between octa and round. We do have some round light modifiers, and we have some, uh, most of them are octas. Our um, octas will have eight sides. We are round ones, we have a 24 inch beauty dish, uh, rapid box, and we have three Zeppelin, we call them Zeppelins, 20, 35 inch, 47 inch, and 59 inch. These are special purpose uh, studio strobe modifiers that are very deep, parabolic, and all these are very round. They have 16 spines which make them exponentially more expensive because it's harder to put all those spines in. That will give you a totally round catch light in the eye. So there's a difference there. Um, and let's, when we're, while we're talking about light modifiers, let's go over the difference here. And we're, I'm gonna start getting some lighting patterns and some softer light and how we can build a photograph. Um, we, we basically have three light modifiers available to us as photographers and videographers. We have umbrellas, reflectors, and soft boxes. That's basically it. Umbrellas, you all know what they are. Concave surface. They work because what they do is they make a light source bigger. The one light that most people have the most trouble with are speed lights. And the reason they have trouble with speed lights is because they're very small, and very harsh. Um, when you have such a small light source and uh, the electronic flash itself is pretty powerful and harsher than the sun, you really have to make that bigger to make it even halfway palatable. An umbrella does that. You reflect into an umbrella, it makes it bigger. What an umbrella does is spits light all over the place. You can just picture it, it's got a concave surface, light rays hit it through the whole range of the curve, and it's gonna spit light all over. It's great. We make a lot of different size umbrellas for the same purposes we make different size soft boxes. It has to do with coverage and softness. We make like, uh, I think our smallest is 32 inches, 43, so I think we have 47, 60 inch. We make a seven foot, a seven foot umbrella too, seven foot. Uh, we make them in different surfaces, silver, white, 
diffusion, all these different purposes. Um, the great thing about umbrellas is that they're relatively simple to use. You put the light into it, you point it towards something, you're going to get softer light. The downside is that they're non-directional. A softbox is very directional. As I, as I move that softbox, I change the position of the shadow. So just to show you, so we can see a, a visual representation, there is one position. And now I'm going to just move the softbox like here. And same thing. And we're going to see a difference in the position of shadows. Going back to the other one, you can see the difference. A pretty major difference. And that's what softboxes do for you. And softboxes will put light in a very specific spot. I love softboxes because it gives me that ability to, to uh, control those shadows and the specular highlights. Reflectors, I have one right here. Reflectors are probably the most useful light modifier ex that exists. They're relatively inexpensive. They're easy to use. Anybody can use them. We have many different surfaces, many different sizes. And again, we have different sizes for the same reason we have different size soft boxes. It all depends on how much you're trying to uh, light up and how much, soft, how much softness you want, how far away it is. Diffusion panels are collapsible. Same type of thing. This happens to be our 30-inch Illuminator 4-in-1 kit. It's actually got uh, four surfaces. We say it's diffusion. You can, you can light through this. You can use this as a right reflector to reflect off of it. We've got silver, and we have sunlight, which is a weave of gold and silver. The package collapses down into this small one. I love the 30-inch because I travel a lot, and that's really easy to carry around. They're relatively easy to, to collapse. Anybody have trouble collapsing these things? I can do it really easy, right? I'm really good at it because I've been doing practicing. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, since this is a basic class, I'm going to show you how to collapse these things. The smaller ones are easier. When you get bigger ones, they get harder and harder to collapse. Yeah, really hard. I have collapsed a, um, we um, are used to make a, a six by seven foot collapsible background. We do make a four foot by six foot diffusion panel. Those are hard to collapse. I find a 50 inch is, is really, it gets harder. But let me show you the two different methods we have to collapse a, a, a reflector. The big mistake that people make is that you have the reflector in your hand and you have your thumbs on one side and you try and collapse it. Well, your arm doesn't twist that way. It, it just doesn't work. So the easiest way is you have, I'm using my thumb and putting it against the edge of the um, reflector, of the, uh, the band. This hand, I turn my palm away. And you can see what's gonna happen. If I twist it, okay? Uh, the band in there wants to collapse on itself, you're just guiding it along. So I'll do it slowly. Okay, simple, real easy. Bigger, they're a little bit harder. If you have a really big one, sometimes as you're grasping it like this and you're trying to twist it as hard. So we have the taco method. Just think taco. What you do is you get it and you fold it like a taco, just like that, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna explain what I'm gonna do and then I'll show you. I'm gonna put the bottom up over here and this is gonna go over this way. The, the, the biggest mistake people make when they do the tocket method is they grasp it on the top and it, it's not gonna collapse. You gotta hold it really lightly. Okay? I make it look simple, right? Because it is. You gotta practice it a little bit. Taco method. Bring this up. This is gonna go over the top. Okay? That's how you do it. So, reflectors are great. Um, I love reflectors because they act like an additional light. And I'm going to be doing a very simple two light setup. My second light is behind my subject. And here, here's the, uh, you now we're starting to talk about, about lighting patterns and simple lighting. And I'm talking about portrait lighting. Um, I really only need one light. 
I, I, I can do a lot of my photography with just one light. Reflector is really handy. Let's go through them step by step. Let's do a one light setup. Move this out of the way. Now, if I have a one light, I am not going to put it like I just did a second ago. I'm going to move the light a little bit. And I put it up. OK. Now I'm going to go into a vertical mode because we're doing vertical pictures. OK. I'm guessing my, my exposure should be correct. It should be pretty close. Here we go. Let's look at this full size. One light shot. That's not bad. I mean, I could, I could definitely go with this. Uh, you're, you're favoring your good side a little bit too much, Logan. I've shot with Logan many times, and, and she has a good side, which is this side of her face. She yells at me if I try and shoot the other side of her face, right? Yeah, she didn't like, like that. So just move it a little bit over this way. Yeah, that's it, straight on, like that. What that's going to do, it's going to change the shadow a little bit. See that? Where the first one, and I'll show you again, I'll show you the thumbnail here. That had a little bit of a, um, a shadow on the nose, and then the next one did not. I don't know if I can go to the next picture without the thumbnail. So I kind of like that. That's OK. That's OK. Now let's add a reflector to it. Now, with a reflector, I'm going to change my lighting just a little bit. If I only have one light, I had to put it a little bit more in front of her because I didn't want that long shadow coming off of her nose. So I'm going to get into a slightly different position of the light. Like this. Now I put it as close as I can. And I'm going to feather the light a little bit. Feathering is a very, very simple technique. This is straight on, and this is feathering. It's really just putting the light a little bit off center. And really, I'm positioning it for the reflector. So I'll show you guys here and see if you can see the difference, and I'll shoot a picture of it. So you can see on her, her right side, there is some shadow there. I'm going to fill in that shadow just with the reflector pretty easily. It's like magic. It's just great. Now, you can use a fill light. You can use a, another light to do this. But why? I mean, if I'm doing a portrait and I have the ability to have another light for a fraction of the cost and it's going to give me a really nice look, I'm going to use the reflector. It's very simple to use. Now, here's one of the, I'm not going to say difficulties. This is one of the things you have to keep in mind if you're using a reflector. A reflector, since it has a flat surface, is just the same as a softbox. It's directional. So I can just show you here. I'm not going to shoot pictures of it. But as I move the reflector around, I can get a different look. OK, depending on exactly where I put it. So having it in one spot accurately, I think, is pretty important. Now, when, when I have a couple daughters, my daughters are grown now. They're 23 and 26. And when they were teenagers, uh, I would shoot example pictures like this, and I would ask them to hold my reflector. How long do you think a teenage girl will hold a reflector before she starts complaining? I think the longest I got was about 30 seconds. I think it was 30 seconds. Oh, Dad, do I have to do this? So that's why I love reflector arms. They never complain. 
You don't have to pay for them to go to college. They're great. You know, they last forever. I can abuse them. I can do anything I want with them. They're great. And they're very accurate. Now, now seriously, when I have a human, um, Bob Davis, a good friend of mine who is a, uh, a great photographer out of Chicago. We've had him in the, in the event space here a couple times. Fantastic photographer. I love his line with that. He said when you, you have someone hold the reflector or a light, it's called a voice-activated light stand or a voice activated reflector holder. Well, I, 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 you know, this is much more accurate and it's going to stay where I put it. So I love reflector arms. You just, it will hold any reflector. This will expand to six feet. Again, I happen to have a 30 inch one on here. Got a double ball head so I can move it into position the way I want. And here's the beauty of continuous light is that I can see that light. Okay, I wanna have you turn that way towards the light a little bit more. That's it, right there. Actually, let's go straight on first. Yeah, let's do this. We'll, we'll get into this in, in just a second about posing. Okay, so now here's the same shot with a reflector. you're gonna see it's gonna fill in on that shadow side quite nicely. Let's show you an example. There's without the reflector, with the reflector. The differences here are subtle, folks, but we're looking at the density of the shadow. So the reflector is a really great fill. Now, the one thing I don't like about this photograph is it's kind of flat. And here's where my second light comes in, which is a rim light. Um, the big mistake that a lot of inexperienced lighters use when they're doing portraits is if I give them two lights, you put one over here at about 45 degrees because someone told them you put it at 45 degrees and you measure it, it's exact. And then what happens is they turn it on and they usually have it too far away. They have it like six or eight feet, which means you're gonna get a heavy shadow across the nose. You start freaking and you go, oh, I better get rid of that shadow. I wanna put another light on the other side, 45 degrees. So you got this, like I'm, I'm copying a piece of paper. That's copy work type of lighting, when I have two lights exactly the same distance away, exactly the same power. Uh, I mean, it works sometimes if you have someone that's got a perfect face, um, that's called flat lighting. But typically, I don't wanna do that. I want one side of the face got a little bit of shadow on it uh, as opposed to the other one. Uh, flat lighting is when the whole face is lit evenly. And what ends up happening is it's flat. So if I want to add some depth to it, what we're really doing here is taking a 3D object and put it on a 2D medium. I want it to look 3D. So my second light is from behind. Some people call it a hair light. I don't necessarily uh, use hair lights. I'm not sure if it's because I'm, I'm bald and I don't have any hair to light up anymore, but a, light, a hair light, it does come from directly above. It's not really not my style. I like to have a rim light that's kind of a hair light. And you can see the position of it right here. I'm gonna turn it on right now. Um, uh, Logan's got very light colored hair, uh, light color colored skin, and I, I, I'm not sure if the light is gonna be far enough away. It might be a little bit too, too contrasty, but let's, let's see what it looks like. So let's put this light on. I'm gonna turn it way down. And in fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off the main light and I'm gonna show you what a rim light does. Actually, that's great, just like that. Now what should happen is the face should go pretty dark. We have a lot of light in here, so we're gonna see some detail. Uh, that's a rim light. And I don't really like that right now, and can you tell why? That's a rim light. There's a little stray piece of light there. You see where it's going? On her nose. Well, um, when people look at portraits of themselves, this is a proven fact. Um, I, I remember seeing a TV program where you, you have a portrait of yourself and they're able to track where the eyes looked if you're looking at yourself. And 
people like, like heck avoid looking in their own eyes when they look at a photograph of themselves. They bounce around, they look at their eyes and they bounce around, they bounce around. What they keep on going back to is their nose. Everybody looks at their nose. Everybody thinks their nose looks too big. And the surest way to make a nose look even bigger is to put some light on it, you know, emphasize it. I don't want to do that. So that rim light is not good because it's, it's showing your nose. Now, this, there are a couple simple solutions to it. Number one, just turn your head that way just a teeny bit. Just teen, her, turn your head just a little bit. Watch this. That nose, the light on the nose is going to go away. You can do it. There we go. Gone. So this illustrates what a rim light does. It highlights the hair. Uh, she's got dark clothing on. There's a little bit of a highlight on her, on her shoulder. Not much. That's OK. The other thing I can do is change the position of the light or move my barn door in. So I'm going to move the barn door in just a little bit. And I'm showing you this to see the, the slight differences that happen. You move your head back where it was, which I think was right straight on. Here, straight on. We're probably going to see that, sh that light on her nose go away. OK? So I mean, these are very subtle, subtle changes that mean a lot. So let me turn my, my main light back on. I got my reflector in a good spot. Let's take a shot. Let's see what it looks like. This should be a pretty complete picture. There we go. Voila. We got a pretty nice portrait going on here. Let me show you a full size so you can see it. Now, there's one thing wrong when let's talk about posing. Right now, her shoulders are parallel to the film, film plane. Okay? Parallel. We have a word for that. It's called a mug shot. That's a mug shot. That's exactly what they do when you are arrested. You haven't experienced that, right? No. Nah, I haven't. But I'm, I'm on shot. What it does is it makes you look wide. So the simple solution is just to have someone's shoulders move. So, yeah, you want to move away from it? That's fine. Great. That's not, I, I think. Actually, let's have you move towards the light first. Let's do that first. I, I want to talk about that posing technique. Okay. Turn your head a little more towards me, just like that. That's great. Now we're going to see on this photograph, it's going to it's going to make her look different. It slims someone down, is what it does. It's just a, it's a very subtle change. Now, I did have her facing towards the light in that one shot. Now we're going to have her facing away from the light. And your head turning a little bit more toward a little bit more. Actually. Right about there. Now, the differences between these two, and your, your heads, are, I, 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 I'm going to take another one because I, I don't like the way the one looks. Um, get your, your right bang. Let's get it out of there. Let's see what that looks like. Head more towards the camera, turning more towards me. Your, just your head more towards me. More, a little bit more, a little bit more. Come on, you can do it. Yeah. There we go. Okay, this is a fairly typical um, pose for a female. Uh, we can exaggerate it where they're looking over her shoulder. Let's try one of those. Let's show her one of those. Yeah, you're going to have to really turn your head for me. Um, yeah, like that. You know, so I haven't really changed the position of the light at all. The reflector just a little bit. Uh, it's pretty generally a, a good lighting. So that's a fairly typical pose you can put a female in. Any of you guys here, you think if I asked you to strike that pose, you would do it? You know, men don't do that. They don't do that well, looking over their shoulder. It's, it's, just, it's just not something we typically do. So be aware of what position you have someone in relation to a light. So now let's talk about some lighting patterns. And these are pretty basic. 
um, uh, let's get in some short and broad lighting. And we have, uh, we have several lighting patterns we can get into. I want to keep them simple. Broad and short are the ones we're going to use most of the time when you have a very simple lighting setup like this. And the definition is, is pretty simple. When I have a broad lighting, it has to do with the position of the light and the position of someone's nose in relation to the camera. Okay? Now I'm looking at the camera right now, and I'm looking straight on. So that's a full face shot. But typically what you do is you move, the cam you move someone's face a little bit. So if I'm off like this, the camera's on this side, that's the side facing the camera. If I have the light on this side, it's called broad lighting. If I move the nose like this, where the side of the face that the light is on is away from the camera, that's short lighting. Pretty simple. Short lighting will slim down the face a little bit. Broad lighting will widen it up a little bit. Now, with Logan, it really doesn't matter what I use, but let's, let's show you anyway. And I'm going to show you without the reflector. Lighting patterns. Let's, I'm gonna, first of all, I'm going to change my exposure to 100th. And let's exaggerate this a little bit. So you turn your head a little bit more. OK, just like that. This is going to be broad lighting. I'm not going to change anything. All I want to do is change the position of her head. And a little bit more. A little bit more. Uh, looking right at me, though. That's good. This is going to be short lighting. There we go. That's short lighting. I'm going to go back and forth between the two of them. Short, broad. That's what it is. That's the difference. Subtle, but it's there. I find that people with, as their skin is darker, it shows up even more. Um, uh, Logan is like reflecting light like crazy. She's reflecting, reflecting light off herself. And I think I'm still a little bit overexposed. I want to knock that down a little bit. It's kind of 125th. Slight differences in exposure. Short at 125th. That shows it up even better. That's, that, that, that's, true. that's broad lighting. We're broad now. Let's go short with the same, same exposure. A little bit more. There we go. There we go. That's what it is. Now, I actually kind of like that lighting right there. I mean, you know, Logan's got such a great face that she doesn't like that, though, do you? Yeah, you see, she doesn't, she doesn't like that. And I have to be cognizant of what my subject wants. So I already know she doesn't like that. So I'm not going to make her do it anymore, OK? And if I, if, I want, if I want to get that kind of lighting out of her, I'll move the light. So we'll, we'll, we'll stick it where you're, you're comfortable. I want your comfort spot. And with that comfort spot, I definitely need that reflector. But let, let's do some butterfly lighting on you. Let, let, let's show you butterfly. Butterfly is a little bit more complicated. And I think it will work with Logan with no problem. Butterfly lighting. In fact, before I, I talk about that, though, in fact, I think I can show you right over here. Yeah. So um, both broad and short lighting are a form of loop lighting. Loop. And all that means is that it's a little bit of a loop shadow around the nose, one of the nostrils, one of them, right here. I'll use the pointer so people online can see what I'm talking about here. So right here, that's the loop. And on the uh, other one, let's go back to the broad lighting. There's still a loop there over there, but pretty in deep shadow. That's loop lighting. It's got to be, it should be pretty tight on the nostril. If you have the light too high, that shadow will get too long. It makes the lows look big, and you don't want that. Butterfly lighting is where I have a loop on both sides of the nostrils, like a butterfly. And I'll put the light from directly above. Uh, this only works with uh, certain people. 
they have to have a, a pretty strong face. Um, I'm certainly not going to use it on someone like me. Um, guys have, or, or men, have a little bit of a harder time with butterfly lighting unless they've got a chiseled face that's really kind of narrow, okay? Um, as men get older, like me, and we put on weight, our, our faces get wider. And what butterfly lighting does is make it even wider. And if I'm gonna do anything as a portrait photographer, is I wanna take weight off of people, not put it on. Um, um, so if I have, someone who's young, slim, especially if they've got prominent cheekbones, um, I can use butterfly lighting. And butterfly lighting is, is pretty much just coming from straight above. I'm not gonna use a rim light or anything else just to show you what the light is like. My exposure shouldn't change. Straighten this guy up. Why don't you, you turn your shoulders though? Because we're still getting the mug shot done. You want to turn that way. I know the way you want to turn. Okay, that's fine. Our head, our chin down just a little bit. Head a little bit more towards me. A little bit more. Here's butterfly lighting. I'm a little underexposed. Let's open that up a little bit and take one more. I'm gonna to go to a hundredth of a second, head a little bit more towards me. There we go. That's butterfly lighting. Remember, I have no reflectors here or anything else. Typically what we do when we're doing butterfly lighting, we turn it into a clamshell. And a clamshell is just putting a reflector underneath. Oops, did I get you? Almost. As Logan will probably attest, sometimes you'll have a photographer ask you to hold the reflector. Do you ever get that? No? Okay, well, I'm not gonna ask you either. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it myself here with my arm. Actually, I gotta tilt it down just a little bit more. When I tilt it down, the reflector will pick up some of that light. We have an easier light modifier to do this with. I did not bring one along today because this is a basic class. We have the eye lighter, which some of you may have heard of. Yeah. It's a curved, beautifully big curved single light modifier. It's gorgeous because what it does is made to put light into the face like I'm trying to do right here and also give a very nice catch light on the eye. Okay, Logan, turn yeah, just like that. So here's a more complete picture with a, with a reflector. I think it's gonna look pretty good with her. Very typical butterfly lighting. It's, it's kind of flat, a little bit on the flat side. Uh, it doesn't concern me with her. She's got a, a great face structure. You know, let's get one picture of you smiling. You're so serious today. Are you? Well, you, you know, it doesn't have to be a full smile. You can just do a little, a, you know, a cute little smile. You know what I mean. Yeah, just a little one. Come on, show a little bit of my, yeah, that's it. A little bit of a smirk, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I like that. Look, look at now. Now, now we're getting. She's she's thinking of something. We don't know what it is, right? No, you're not. Okay, just a little bit of a smirk. Um, our jobs as portrait photographers is to pull something out of your subject too, and, and it's not something I can teach you here in a in a, in a two hour class. It's a personality thing. Um, I, I would suggest uh, some other people to look for for um, uh, that kind of subject. Check out Peter Hurley. He's got some some. Videos, I believe, on um, certainly on Westcott's webpage, 
frankfjwestcott.com, frankjosephwestcott.com. And I am about 99% sure if you do a search on B&H's uh, videos, you will find at least two or three entries by Peter Hurley. Peter Hurley is a great headshot shooter. When you shoot portraits with most people, they're not used to being in front of a camera. In fact, I would put to you that 90% of the people that you shoot as a portrait would rather be in a dentist chair than be in front of the camera. It's very, very difficult to be in front of the camera. Um, and when you shoot with electronic flash, you're telegraphing them when you're taking every picture. So um, your, your subject has the tendency of tensing up anyway. And what you're doing is, is you're telling them when to tense up, which is right before you take the picture. So if you've ever, how many people have ever sat for a professional portrait? Okay, maybe you should do it sometime to see what it feels like, okay? I did it, I did it once, and I can tell you, I, I did it unfortunately in front of a group of people. It was, it was at a PPA event. In fact, it was Clay Blackmore, one of our other top pros, Westcott top pro. And Clay Blackmore was doing a PPA event, Professional Photographers of America. And he called me up to take my portrait. And I tell you, it was, it was freaking awful. I mean, I, I was very, very self-conscious. But, but um, he had such a manner to him. Clay is a, is a very skilled portrait photographer. I mean, you get a skilled portrait photographer in front of you, he just started talking to me really quietly. I can't remember a word that he said, folks. But after about three or four minutes, I just, I, I calmed down. It was him interacting with me one-on-one. -on -one. I forgot about the crowd, and he took some really nice portraits of me. So um, he was using continuous light, which made it easier. With electronic flash, when you're sitting there and you're waiting for that picture to be shot, and you're waiting, it's like you're thinking to yourself, just shoot the darn picture. You get more and more tense. And what happens is you, 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 the picture shoots, you close your eyes, and then you relax after you shoot the picture. Um, have you ever had a blinker in front of you that no matter what you do, you catch your, their eyes closed with electronic flash? That's really, really insidious because um, it's physically impossible, absolutely physically impossible for you to be a subject in front of a camera with electronic flash. And the flash to fire and you recognize it and close your eyes and have the camera capture it. Follow what I'm saying? It's impossible. We can't react that quickly. The electronic flash is usually firing from between a two thousandth and a ten thousandth of a second. It's really, really fast. The shutter speed is about one two hundredth of a second. Our brains don't work that fast. So anytime you capture someone with their eyes closed, they started shutting their eyes before you shut the picture. I'm just telling you, that's the way it is. So these kind of things come into mind when I'm shooting a portrait. The other things that come into mind are these facial patterns or these patterns I've been talking about. And let's talk about that for a second. Um, I've talked a lot about uh, soft light and harsh light and specularity. So there are times, I'm, I'm, I have a certain style, and we're all going to develop our own style as photographers. Um, I, I like this kind of photograph where I have someone in dark clothing. I would rather have a black background. Um, we just don't have a lot of space here for a background, but this is dark enough. I like, that's called low key, low key, dark background dark clothing, face pops out. I love it. Other people like high, um, high key, white background, very bright white. Uh, that's, your, that's a style that you want to have. The specularity that's on someone's face is a, is a different animal, where I will sometimes want softer light and sometimes want harsher light. I'm more of a soft light shooter. I like soft light. I like that, that graduation on the nose. I, I, I don't I like the lack of these bright white highlights. You can see on this picture of Logan, there is some highlights there, but they're not overwhelming. This is relatively soft lighting here. Most of these photographs I've taken are softish. Other types of lighting are um, uh, glamour type lighting where you may have a light coming from up above. I think we can try that with you. You're, 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 you can be glamorous. <laughs> it's, very, it's a very classic, Hollywood 
old Hollywood type of look. I might even have to take the diffusion panel off. Let's try that. I'm gonna try. If any of you have an idea of, of, a, of a kind of lighting panel you'd like to see, I'd love to, I'd love to do it. Let's try and duplicate anything you want. Let's put this light up. Head just the way. Let's see if I can get that right pattern on there. In fact, you're gonna look up into the light. Look up into the light. Look, you turn your body. Let's get rid of the reflector. Yeah, no reflector. Okay. I think you see what I'm trying to do here. You can you can see I'm trying to position her. It's a headshot. Okay, now I think bringing your eyes to the camera, let's see what that looks like with your eyes on the camera. Let's, let's see what it looks like. Yeah, it's okay. I, I think you see what I'm, what I'm trying to accomplish here. I think we have to put a light a little bit higher, and I don't think you have to look, I don't think you should look on the camera. I think you gotta look, you gotta look away, don't you? Um, and I think not staring necessarily in a light, it's like maybe over here. Let me see what that looks like. I'm gonna leave my, yeah. Let's see that. Think 30s, 40s, Hollywood, that type of thing. There we go. Here's a one light, no rim light, no reflector. Pretty simple stuff. I took the diffusion panel off. I made it a little bit harsher. So I'm getting, I purposely wanted the shadow underneath the chin. These are the kind of things you can do with lighting. It's just a matter of practice. You can be daring a little bit. Um, there are different um, lighting patterns that are out there that you just invent. Now I gotta wrap this up. It's just about two o'clock, or three o'clock, pardon me. Well, the crowd that came here, I appreciate you coming. I have no idea what you're gonna see when you go outside. There may be a foot of snow, who knows. Logan, you'll get home. I'll make sure you get home. Thank you. But thank you very much for your attendance and all you people that, that are looking online. Uh, uh, thank you very much for visiting the b &H, uh, event space. And I hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.